The views and opinions expressed on Main Challenge are solely those of the program participants and do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions of Lincoln County Television, its employees, or the producers of this program. Main Challenge is a production of Lincoln County Indivisible. Coming up next on Main Challenge, a conversation with Senate President Troy Jackson and his bill LD1 on keeping us safe from COVID. Hi, and welcome to the main challenge. I am Betsy Sweet. I'm your host today, and I am thrilled to have with me as my guest, Senate President Troy Jackson. Welcome, Troy. We're so glad to have you. Um, wow. Thank you, Betsy. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Nice yeah. to see you. It's nice to see you too. <laughs> we would ordinarily see each other quite a bit, but unfortunately in uh, COVID times, not mm -hmm. so much. So many of you know Troy, um, he's no stranger, but he is an extraordinary uh, Senator for the Maine people. He is the president of the Maine Senate. Um, he is a logger by trade and it was watching the loggers not be treated fairly by corporate America um, that I think inspired you to get involved and to get to run for the legislature. And I will say that I've worked, uh, we've worked together on many, many, many issues, whether it's healthcare or childcare or workers' rights or minimum wage. Um, Troy has always been speaking truth to power and a voice for the people. So it is an incredible honor to have you here. And um, so how, first of all, before we start talking about the policy, how's it going? I mean, you're char in charge of trying to make this work in the days of COVID. How's all that going? Well, I mean, you know, on some hands it's, it's going well, uh, but it's, you know, been very challenging. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, leaving here last March was hard. Uh, of course, at that point, we really didn't know what we were dealing with. And, and you know, we we're talking about that last night. I mean, not having any te testing at that point, not having any vaccines. And, you know, now, you know, we really have done very well with companies right here in Maine. The, uh, testing and, and the vaccines while we don't have enough. I mean, you know, there's hope, uh, but the legislature is, um, you know, it, it certainly has been uh, different and, you know, trying to make the best of it. Uh, you know, what we certainly found out was we were technology wise way behind the times and, and, you know, we need to make those upgrades. But what I, what I am encouraged by, I mean, the silver line in all this is that I think from now on, after we get over COVID, I think people across the state are going to be able to access their state government like they never did before, uh, which is, you know, really exciting for me, uh, you know, especially where I live, uh, that people would have more of an opportunity. So that is the one big benefit. We're still, you know, working through some kinks and, and you know, unfortunately, some of my colleagues, uh, you know, are not uh, doing what I believe uh, would be right for everyone in the state of Maine, but, but we're going to get there. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job. And, you know, it's just hard because the legislature is all about relationships, right? When we, you know, and so it's very, I know as someone who's an advocate, it's, it's very challenging because now instead of just running into you in the hall and saying, hey, hey, what about this thing? Mm -hmm. You know, now it requires a lot yeah. of this. So, um, but, and thank you so much for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to really focus today or start anyway by talking about your LD1 um, and your COVID relief or COVID plan. Um, and I just want to ask you a little bit to talk about what's in it and um, why it was so important for you to get it out and get it out early. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about what's included in LD1, that would be great. Sure. Well, I mean, as you know, Betsy, and I think a big reason why, you know, we have become close. I mean, you know, I believe like you that healthcare is a human right. Uh, you know, I believe that we should have a national health care plan, you know, across this country. And, and so for me, while I think a lot of people know that, you know, I'm a big labor uh, supporter, uh, probably even more health care has, you know, been, you know, my, probably my biggest driver for running in the, in the legislature. I mean, even, you know, on those arguments about wages and stuff like that was, was always tucked in there that, you know, people in the logging industry couldn't get health care. Uh, which, you know, became a big issue. And so, you know, I've certainly focused on a lot of things here with my colleagues and, you know, very happy to have work with people that understood this well, understood it even better than me. And, and, and we have done a lot. And, but this year, obviously, LD1 is always, 
you know, saved to have uh, as a bill that, you know, was a priority that, you know, certainly sets the stage for the legislature. And, and then unfortunately, you know, we are in COVID and, and it just made all the sense in the world that LD1 would be COVID related. And, and that's what it is. And, and um, it's unfortunate that, you know, we're dealing with COVID, but, yeah. but, but we have to, and, and, uh, and we have to do what's right. And so the bill uh, is really an extension of, you know, our belief that healthcare is a human right and that no one in this state should have to be uh, worried that, you know, they're not going to be able to get tested and not going to be able to get the vaccine because, you know, they can't afford to or uh, where they live or anything like that. And, and so we're going to make sure that, and, and it is like, you know, getting back to the national health care plan, it is always a struggle as a main legislator, you know, what we can actually control on a state level. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about, you know, state health care workers, we're talking about main care workers, uh, you know, we're talking about the things that, that we can control, but making sure that, uh, you know, those people and, and uninsured people have the testing that, that they want and need. And, and when they get vaccines come that, you know, they can get a vaccine through no cost to their, you know, out of their pocket, making sure that's not a turn. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a lot of people through this crisis, you know, have foreign gone going to the pharmacy because of being worried about uh, getting the virus. So now you can get 180, 180 day supply of your vaccines, uh, excuse me, your prescriptions instead of your 90 day. And in addition to that, and this has been an issue that we've been trying to deal with. You know, our broadband in the state is, is not where it should be. And a lot of people struggle with that. And, and you know, we've done more in telehealth. That telehealth meant that you had to have visual and audio to, to be able to get it. And, and a lot of people can't do that. And so we made it so that uh, you can just do audio. I mean, most people have phone service uh, so that they can get, um, you know, that telehealth. So it's, it's, you know, a number of things like that. I think they're all very appropriate for the time we're in right now. And, and, and you know, but most importantly is to make sure that people have confidence and, and security in the fact that they can get tested and they can get their vaccines. Yeah. Well, th I, and I think it's so true. I was in, um, actually I was in line for a test and, um, and I happened to be a neighbor in front of me. And so I, we got out and I got out and was talking to them through our masks and distance, but you know, she was teary. She was like, I'm, and she said, you know what? I'm not really worried about getting COVID particularly. She said, I'm worried that I'm going to get COVID and have to go to the hospital. And then I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose, you know, she said, I don't have, I don't have my $10,000 copay. I don't, you know, and, and so sit, and Matt, I, I just thought about sitting there and I felt the same way, you know, I, like sitting there, not really worried about our health, although obviously we are, but then worried about if, if something happens and if we're positive and if we get become one of those people, we're looking at bankruptcy, right? Yeah. I mean, and so I well, think, yeah, and the vaccine. I mean, really that's the whole argument with healthcare in this country is, is if by some bad stroke of fate, uh, you get sick, you know, be it cancer, be it COVID, be it, you know, whatever, that, you know, you're going to be financially ruined and, and what it's going to mean to, you know, your family and, uh, you know, everyone you care about. And so that really is the crux of what our problem is in the United States is that healthcare, you know, bankrupts families all the time and, and, and COVID shouldn't be another, another, uh, you know, barrier for people to yeah. get their healthcare. Wonderful thing. So Troy, Let's talk about that because you know in this fight for healthcare, you know universal healthcare, which you've done so much work on and um, has been awesome. You know, in my experience, people want everybody wants this. It's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's not a you know. It to me, it's much more of an up and down issue. It's much more of people you know who have jobs that provide really great healthcare, right? And and legis and you know the legislature, not main legislature, but the national. You know, so what is, how do we bridge that disconnect, Troy, between something that the vast majority, 80% of Americans and Mainers want universal single payer healthcare, and yet we cannot get the federal government to move on it. And Maine, as you said, is restricted in terms of, limited in terms of what we can actually do. How do we start to bridge that divide? I mean, is, is COVID an opening for us? 
Well, I, I honestly, I don't know if it is or not. I mean, obviously you're talking about a, an unbelievable amount of money that's spent to kept, keep things just exactly the way that it is right now. And, and, and what is really unfortunate about this whole issue is that it's, uh, you know, big pharma, it's uh, healthcare industry that uh, is spending this money to, you know, basically divide us. You know, uh, you know, people that are lucky enough to have healthcare are being told that, if uh, those that don't have health care get it, then your, your, your health care is going to suffer. You're going to lose your health care plan. Uh, you know, you're going to lose. And, and, and then people start getting like concerned for the very reason we talked about that, you know, uh, this is something that can completely devastate a family uh, financially. And, and so then it starts becoming a, a picking winners and losers. And, and the reality is I believe wholeheartedly that, you know, we spend the money in this country already that we could all have, you know, really great health care in this country. Yeah. Uh, but what we can't do is we can't make obscene profits for big corporations, you know, that, that is, is what's happening. I mean, and, and it, it's really easy for me to look at countries like Canada, you know, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, you know, they have national health care plans. They have, you know, full prescription drug coverage. And it's, and it's so good that our own Federal Drug Administration actually puts them in a classification of tier one, meaning they have as good or not better health care in the United States. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you argue that it's not good health care is, is really ridiculous, but it, what it is is money and greed that uh, continues to you know, pick winners and losers and divide America against itself. And, and that's why we don't get what we, what we all deserve. Mm -hmm. my, my, to answer your question you know, very quickly, I mean, the only thing I can see how to do as a state legislator is keep pushing issues on a state level, asking the federal government to you know, either allow importation from Canada, mm -hmm. uh, you know, allow uh, some, you know, uh, blocking surprise medical billing, whatever it is, yeah. and, and just keep the crash going and, and also, you know, reach out to other states to try and help them do the same so that yeah. all these different states, you know, pushing on to the federal government, hopefully they'll get the message one day that they can't deny uh, the American public in what they want. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. Yeah. Well, and you've done an amazing job. I remember last year um, with you up there, I went, went to the dog sled races and I, I remember standing at the bridge Right. And I just looked across the bridge and literally, what is it? Quarter of a mile across the river. Yeah. And I was just like, this so stinks that if I had a heart attack right here, right now, this would bankrupt me. But if I walked across the bridge and had it, you know, it yeah. would be, I'd be taken care of. Yeah. And they, you know, and they've constantly carried on about Canadian healthcare not being good and, and things like that. And like I said, I have relatives that live in Canada. I mean, I, I work with Canadians. I've, I mean, I know Canadians. I, I never have any of the, the, them that actually are getting health care complaining to me about their health care. Uh, oh. I have got a lot of health care uh, industry people over here complaining about Canadian health care, but I'm <laughs> certainly, I think I know why that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. No, I think that, I mean, I, I do, I think it's true. And I remember up talking during the, one of my campaigns, talking with some logging contractors and we were talking about tariffs and these are the contractors, not the loggers, but they were all, you know, and I said, I was listening and learning about the tariff and the problems with the tariffs. And I said, but, and I said, and isn't part of the problem that you are paying 30% of your profits for healthcare and the people 10 miles across the road are not like, isn't mm -hmm. that a competitive disadvantage? You know? So mm -hmm. I think, I mean, and you live, I mean, living up in the Algas, you, yeah. you guys have that comparison yeah. all the time. Well, I mean, and, you know, as a worker, I mean, yeah. I could, I could never bargain for healthcare because you know, the people that were working right alongside him had a national health care plan. Right, right. Oh, gosh, that's awful. Yeah. Well, so, so and, well, I just want to say one thing about the pharmaceuticals. So one of the things that people are really concerned about, I think, is that this the vaccine is going to eventually be cost enough, you know, eventually it's going to start costing us money. People aren't going to have the money to do it. And we're not going to get to the herd immunity and so, so to me, like we gave the pharmaceutical industries billions of dollars to do this fast research and get this done. And they've, you know, responded. So that's good. But now for them to turn around and, and, and make a profit selling the government, the vaccines that we paid them to develop, like, 
mm -hmm. how can we can we expose that anymore? Do we just, you know, sort of say, well, this is the way it is and we keep talking about it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know on a, you know, I mean, I certainly have believed that things like uh, insulin and things like that, that, you know, we had the right as American public to demand, uh, you know, caps on, on these uh, vaccines or, you know, prescriptions or whatever. Uh, I think here in the national crisis uh, that, you know, we have given so much money to uh, big pharma. Uh, we've given them a monopoly on how drugs are sold in this country. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine that, uh, you know, we make sure that people get these vaccines and get them as low cost, if not free uh, as possible. And, and I just, I, I don't, I'm, I'm just not bashful about that at all. I mean, we're in a situation where, you know, people could die. It's unfortunate that, you know, it, it's a national crisis where, you know, 400,000 people have died. Whereas, you know, for families all across the United States, they've had been in crisis all along, you know, maybe it wasn't 400,000 people dying, but there was somebody in their family that was, and they were struggling with the cost of healthcare. And so it's unfortunate that we can't get to that point um, where, where those issues, you know, shouldn't, you know, come up for everyday families, but, but at least in this year, I, I mean, I think there's uh, no doubt that, you know, farmers is going to have to take a back seat and uh, make sure that uh, we get these vaccines out and get people taken care of. Yeah, good. Well, so, so one of the things that your LD1 does is to it sort of lays bare some of the challenges, right, that we have in our healthcare system. And clearly COVID has laid bare some incredible inequities. And I keep hoping it might be a door, you know, a window that we could open on a bigger conversation. But I'm just wondering, so from your perspective, what else, what other issues has um, COVID laid bare for us that are sort of like in our face now that maybe provides a window for us to move forward on around workers, you know, essential worker? What, what other things do you see that are laid bare? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. And it's uh, kind of hard, you know, to talk about this. I mean, because, you know, for the last 10 months, you know, a lot of times me and my family, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, gone away, have, you know, stayed out of the public. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've certainly tried to be accessible more, you know, online and, you know, yeah. and things like that because of my job. But but I certainly was not out in the public like I had been in the past because, you know, the, the whole, especially when we didn't have a vaccine, you know, and I haven't been vaccinated yet, but, you know, you don't want to be a carrier. We shut the legislature down so that we wouldn't pass it, you know, from one end of the yeah. state to the other, which, we, you know, we would have done. I mean, yeah. you know, me coming from Allagash, people coming from York County, I mean, and all showing up in one place. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I talked about it last night, you know, and I, I often make this, this distinction of, <clears throat> You know, fire uh, people, you know, men and women uh, running towards a fire when everyone else, me included, runs away. And, and here we have a situation where healthcare workers and essential workers were actually going towards the, the crisis, going towards COVID virus, while the rest of us were, were you know, leaving. And, and, and it certainly shows that, you know, those professions are underpaid, uh, you know, put really in harm's way because they were considered essential. And, and the problems that we have, I mean, with restaurant workers, uh, you know, educational workers, you know, low pay uh, in, in, in industries that we depend on. I mean, you know, we shut down, uh, uh, you know, one of the greatest economies in the world uh, because of COVID crisis. But we asked all these people to continue because we needed them. We had to have them, uh, you know, truck drivers, grocery sale workers. I mean, you know, people that traditionally don't make. Big, yeah. big money. Um, and, and it just goes to show that, you know, we do have an upside down uh, thought process on uh, who is actually a professional and what they should get paid in this country. And who's important. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the idea of essential workers, <laughs> really, I think I'm hoping that that's a window that we can talk so we can start to talk about not just minimum wage, but we can talk about paid leave and mm -hmm. we can start to talk about, you know, some of these things that, you know, we all know, you know, you and I, and many of us have been talking about for a long time, but now it's like, oh, oh no, this is affecting everybody. Mm -hmm. Like this, yeah. you know, this idea of a basic, I mean, just the idea of the $2,000 checks, a basic income, you know, mm -hmm. like six months ago or 10 months ago, talking about it, right? We were called 
radical, crazy yeah. <laughs> Bernie supporters, yeah. right? And yeah. so, um, but you know, I think now everyone's realizing everyone's better off if everyone is able to mm-hmm. take care of you know some of those mm-hmm. things. Well, but, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, there was a lot of controversy over the six hundred dollar uh, extended unemployment benefit. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I saw more people doing things and spending money in the economy. And, yeah. and, and I think it, it showed that, uh, you know, regardless of what you thought about that or whatever, I mean, I don't think there's anyone that can say that that didn't keep our economy, you know, somewhat stabilized when, when you know, all signs pointed that, you know, we were going to be in a massive problem mm-hmm. uh, while we're still in a problem. I'm not saying that. It's nowhere yeah. near what people predicted. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, that sort of investment, I mean, I think one of the hallmarks of all the work that you do that is so important is you under, you understand and fight for growing things from the ground up, you know, like mm-hmm. that's where our investment should go. That's where our um, concentration should go is, you know, starting mm-hmm. there, not, you know, not, not trickle down. Yeah. Um, so I think, but I'm hoping that maybe enough people have not experienced, people who never thought that they would be in medical danger or financial danger or losing their job. Now, unfortunately, sadly, have a window into that and maybe is an opening for us to actually make some yes. good policy. No problem. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about. So one of the things that seems to have been really effective about the COVID crisis and what we've been able to do is the sort of the daily reporting of how many people have you know, tested positive, how many people are recovering, how many people are in the hospital, some of those statistics. And then I think about our other pandemic that we don't talk about very much, which is the substance abuse disorder and the opioid crisis and, um, and even maybe climate. But what do you think about trying to push to get some of that same kind of reporting to get it up on the screen of people? You know, that sort of imagine if we talked every day about the number of people dying of overdose, you know, and we know that that's really high and, um, you know, or even in the climate, you know, the number of acres of forest or farmland or the ocean, the temperature in the ocean, and we mm-hmm. just did it every day. Mm-hmm. Is that something you think, do you, can you ever foresee something like happening, happening like that so we could actually get some movement? Well, you know, I, I don't know if I ever thought about it that way, but I, I definitely think there might be something there. I mean, you know, I think the opioid crisis, uh, I mean, I, I got to say that I, I don't think I understood uh, what that you know, meant, you know, five years ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I believe, you know, probably the thing that, you know, brought it around the, the most to me was the Portland Press Herald had a um, story on that about, I think it was like 25 different people that had passed away because of opioids and, and the huge range of age and, and uh, you know, economic, uh, you know, disparity between yeah. them, like really brought it home to me that, it didn't matter who you were or what your job was or how much money you had. I mean, there was all these people that for, you know, whatever reason, you know, but most of them legitimate yeah. got hooked yeah. on, on something that was, you know, thrown on to the public mm-hmm. by again, greedy executives that just wanted to make a profit regardless of what, you know, and, uh, and, and, and how it killed them all. And, and, and that really was an eye opener to me that because, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say that I felt this way, but I knew people that, that made the distinction that, you know, if you die to opioids, you know, you're one of the people that maybe didn't want to work. You're yeah, you know, yeah, a loser. You're, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. No, yeah. That you're yeah, the dregs. And, yeah. and it just, you know, became very, very clear to me. And so I think you're, you're, you're you might actually have something there very, uh, you know, I mean, it would also be extremely depressing, but, but certainly very eye-opening to let the, the public know that, you know, that's not what's happening here. This is just everyday people that may have had a back injury or, right. or something yeah. And, and, yeah. and got hooked on something that now we know they knew what it was going to do as far as, yeah. I mean, and, and actually courted that. So Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And figured and put a price tag on it. Yeah. Know? yeah. And it was, it was, it was a, a really big price tag. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so we have, there's so much to do and I know that, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to highlight. We're actually getting to the end of our time, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to highlight, but mostly, most importantly, how can the viewers, people who are watching people, how can we help you? 
How can we help make sure that this bill passes, this COVID, COVID package, as well as some of the other, like push the windows open a little further on yeah. wages and equity and you know, all of those things? What can we do to help you? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I appreciate that, Betsy. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, like you said, it may be multiple issues, but I mean, you know, there's things that I've, you know, been fighting for here for a long time that I haven't been able to get through with, you know, all different administrations. And, and to me, it just seems like the, the main people, uh, you know, believe in this, uh, you know, these things wholeheartedly. But to, to answer your question, I mean, I've been struck by, this building, you understand it um, through the years, you know, we operate on a Monday through Friday system. You know, if you're a working class person, you're, you're probably not going to be here. And if you are, you took a day off and, you know, and that's going to affect you. And, and so I've always believed wholeheartedly that people getting legislators, getting a name and a face with a, with a piece of legislation is really, really important. And so, Maybe, you know, because of COVID, because of, uh, you know, our, our accessibility now, as far as people being able to either call into a hearing or, or get on a Zoom, you know, I really think the issues that people care about, you know, flooding the legislature with uh, those calls and getting on, maybe, you know, even though it's only three minutes, but getting on and saying, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm an everyday person and, and this is legislation that is really, really important to me and, and just, you know, making making that uh, making legislators, I mean, myself included, feel very uncomfortable that we don't support something that the people in Maine uh, want, despite uh, you know lobbyists telling us otherwise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, is really really important. I mean, um, I think that's the most effective way to get things across. Um, you know, and get things passed and change it is, is people getting taken hold of their, their government. Right. So, so folks, speak up, show up, um, do what you can to support this LD1, which is just, again, a window into our healthcare system. Troy also has incredible legislation on pharmacy uh, prices and uh, workers and, you know, basically anything that Troy does, you, you want to get that out there and support. So, um, cause he has been working for the people of Maine for a long time. So, um, but it is, it is, uh, awesome. And so and let me ask a question, which you don't have to answer, but so what can we, um, entice you and encourage you to not only stay in, but to look at other opportunities around the state? Any, any chance? Oh. What, do we, what, do we have to do to, what do we have to do to encourage you? <laughs> Well, I tell you, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know where I'm from and who I am and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, sitting in this office as Senate president, I mean, I never thought I'd ever be in a position like this. And I'm very, very happy because I have a great caucus and I work with a great group of people, you know, but in the event that uh, something else, you know, may or may not open up, I mean, you know, I, I would always consider it. But, you know, I'm very happy where I am right now. And, and you know, staying and in this position is more than enough for me. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job, and uh, we may just, you know, who knows what opportunities might arise. <laughs> that we can true, like I said, I didn't ever think I'd be in here. <laughs> right. So, right. <laughs> well, Troy, it's an honor to have you. Um, I just want to say I am always grateful for the work that you do, but especially Thanks. now during the during this pandemic, as we are people are scared and uncertain, um, having your steady hand and your big heart at the helm is is really something that Maine is proud of. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, we will do whatever we can to help. And if you ever want to come back on and if you have something else you want yeah, us to talk about, absolutely. we welcome that. you back anytime. Sounds good. Well, the feeling's mutual, Betsy. And thank you for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All Take right. care. Take good care. Show your support for Maine Challenge and LCTV's programming. We're all about community. Please go to lctv.org to make a contribution. Your support makes us stronger together.